Our climate is changing rapidly. Heat waves, droughts, floods, extreme weather events. Are we ready to adapt? The challenges are many, but solutions are within reach. We can build our resilience and overcome the climate and biodiversity crises. We are connecting groundbreaking research and innovation to the everyday actions and choices of people, businesses, investors, and policymakers. Join the fifth European Climate Change Adaptation Conference. This is where Europe comes together for climate change adaptation. Get inspired. The time to act is now. Good morning to our virtual audience of climate action enthusiasts. Good morning also to our esteemed speakers and to my fabulous fellow moderators. A very, very warm welcome to you all to the fifth European Climate Change Adaptation Conference, ECA 2021. We are so excited to bring this to you from the European Commission DG Research and Innovation so that it can be beamed directly into your offices and your living rooms at home. Now, of course, this event is organised by DG Research and Innovation, its host, its organiser, but in collaboration with Horizon 2020 Project Sincere, Cascades and Receipt, led by the brilliant JPI Climate, the joint programming initiative connecting climate knowledge for Europe. My name is Katrina Sickle. I'm a sometime broadcaster, currently these days a moderator, and I have the privilege of guiding all of us through this fabulous content-rich event, which closes around four o'clock today. Now, you are going to be hearing from a plethora of extraordinary speakers, and you're going to enjoy their contributions as orchestrated by a handful of wonderful fellow moderators who are highly experienced in all of these different topics and issues that are on the table for today's discussions. You'll also get to take a short coffee break around 11 o'clock and a slightly longer lunch break at about 12.45. Now, the focus of today's event is, of course, inspiring climate action now for a resilient by future. And how are we doing that? Well, we're doing that by bringing adaptation solutions to life, by exchanging knowledge, by creating connections. And we're really going to throw the spotlight on the need to increase climate resilience in Europe, but also, of course, beyond, in the context of rising climate risks. Now, this is a particularly important year, as I think those of you in the audience will surely know, because climate adaptation is a key theme of 2021. We've got the adoption of the new EU climate adaptation strategy. Of course, we've got the first climate adaptation summit is in January, and we've got coming up COP26 in Glasgow with the global adaptation goal. So with this particular edition of ECHA, we really want to help accelerate the transfer of knowledge from science to policy and action and really explore how we do that in an efficient way. Now, this is the event is a lot of, well, I'd say the culmination of a lot of really heavy lifting on the part of JPI and the Commission and many of the speakers and moderators that you are going to see featuring at today's event because nine webinars took place in the lead up to this very high level event and there was all sorts of solution uh, options with, were discussed there. They were developed projects and programs in Europe presented and discussed by various stakeholders. And the great thing is that on the ECHA website, there's a virtual library of all sorts of outputs. So you get to see plenty of actionable projects. Now, out of those nine webinars came some fabulous messages, 10 messages. They're kind of still a work in progress, but everybody who's in this event has got those messages to hand. And we're going to use them to have our discussions today and also to nourish the journey ahead to COP26. So that's what the thread is tying together that journey to today and today's event. That's almost enough of preamble from me. A very, very important reminder of how you all can get involved. Yep, this is as interactive as we can possibly make it. I'll be asking you to take part in a few polls throughout the course of the day. Now, to do that, you need to jump on slido.com. 
www.slideout.com. There you have it on the screen now. You've even got the QR code. Hashtag ECA2021 is, of course, the event code. That will take you to us, and that will enable you to very, very easily take part in all of those polls. Of course, you can make your voice heard at any time you like on Twitter. Also, hashtag ECA2021 and hashtag climate neutral EU. So, a lot to take in. Do not worry. Myself and my fellow moderators are going to take you very, very beautifully through this journey today. I know that at some point or other, you're going to have to work alongside no problem. But please do stay with us right until the very end because this is packed with really, really good stuff. I promise you. Something for everybody. Well, who better to launch us on this wonderful journey, of course, than the Executive Vice President for the European Green Deal, Franz Timmermans. Let's hear from him now. As we go into another summer with what could be record-breaking temperatures, citizens will be once more reminded that the climate crisis is affecting us already. This reality is exactly what brings you all together here in Europe, and what will bring the world together in Glasgow at COP26 later this year. Even if global and European efforts to cut greenhouse gas emissions prove effective, locked-in effects of past emissions are already causing our climate to change. The frequency and severity of climate and weather extremes is increasing, and we must adapt to it. To tackle the climate and biodiversity crises, every country in the world will need to set clear targets. A growing group of countries is already committed to climate neutrality by 2050, and I invite others to join us in this race towards climate neutrality and halting biodiversity loss. To accelerate our efforts to adapt to climate change, this February, the European Commission adopted a new and more ambitious adaptation strategy. The Portuguese presidency made this strategy a priority so that earlier this month, the Environment Council adopted a very good set of conclusions that endorse its vision of climate resilience by 2050. With it, we will support knowledge exchanges and scaling up of concrete adaptation solutions that are easy to implement and accessible to countries around the world. Protecting and restoring nature will be crucial as healthy forests, oceans and other ecosystems are essential for climate adaptation. The new strategy puts nature-based adaptation at the forefront. We cannot allow climate impacts to hit the most vulnerable the same way the COVID-19 pandemic did. We are only as resilient as the most vulnerable among us. Therefore, we will intensify our work supporting regions and communities, making sure nobody is left behind. The science policy dialogue is indispensable in order to help decision-making when dealing with a climate that humanity has not experienced before. Today's conference is a key opportunity for knowledge exchange. Policymakers at all levels need to know about climate change risks and about ways and solutions to better and faster inform their decisions. I'm particularly hopeful for the promise of a novel instrument in Horizon Europe, the missions. One of the announced missions aims to support hundreds of regions and communities in Europe to become climate resilient. The mission on adaptation will provide a space to experiment with various ways of adapting to climate change and to help adaptation solutions to reach every corner in Europe, enabling local actors to take action. Missions are also meant to strengthen the engagement of citizens in climate action one of the commitments of the Green Deal. We're doing this through the Climate Pact, which we launched last year. I'm glad to see that some of the Climate Pact ambassadors will speak today. The bedrock of adaptation is local action, because climate impacts are local realities, and the communities affected are best placed to tackle them. At the same time, the international side is key. We're all busy with the preparation of the COP26 in Glasgow later this year. Adaptation to climate change will be one of the important subjects. Climate impacts outside our borders will increasingly affect Europe as well. 
There is a lot for us to learn, for example, from countries like Bangladesh and small island developing states. The EU already dedicates more than half of the international climate finance to adaptation or joint adaptation and mitigation measures, and we're calling on others to follow suit. We must be serious about adaptation. Together, we can tackle this challenge with the urgency it demands. We need to build back a better and more climate resilient Europe. And of course, warm thanks there to Executive Vice President Franz Timmermans. And let me just quote, we are only as resilient as the most vulnerable among us. And lots and lots of things there. He spoke already saying the climate pact would be spoken about today. We will see some of those ambassadors. The importance of nature based adaptation, local solutions, the local dimension, and of course, the critical importance of scaling up adaptation solutions and the Horizon Europe missions. Now, that gives us a lovely segue in just a moment. But before we come to that segue with the first couple of speakers who will join me, as you all know, well, a picture speaks a thousand words. So this next clip is going to give you a feel for those messages that I mentioned came out of the nine fabulous webinars leading up to today's event. So take a look. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. ECA 2021 started with a series of webinars over the course of May and June. Now, what have we learned from these events that brought together more than a thousand knowledgeable people committed to adaptation that should inform the discussions today at our closing event of ECA 2021? First, the COVID pandemic has taught us that we can work collaboratively to tackle global crisis. Now, the ECA community invites you all to work with us, including governments, businesses, scientists and citizens. We believe that the only way forward to bring adaptation solutions to life is by empowering people. Integrating local knowledge with science is also key, and nature-based solutions can give us examples of how to do this. But we cannot tackle the global climate crisis without tackling the biodiversity crisis. And let's not forget that adaptation must go hand in hand with mitigation. Now we are finding ourselves at a pivotal moment in human history. The way that we are doing business today will not deliver for adaptation. Finding new ways to integrating the true costs of economic actions on society and on nature is critical to avoid further harm. But Europe cannot adapt to climate change alone. Europe must support adaptation in partner countries that are heavily affected by climate impacts. These messages largely capture the spirit of our webinars. Each of them was led by champions convened by JPI Climate on behalf of the European Commission and in cooperation with Horizon 2020 projects Sincere, Recede and Cascades. Thank you all for participating at the ECA conference today and let's work together towards adaptation solutions for a resilient future. Enjoy the conference today. And thanks there to Dr. Hannah Knepen. And very important, I didn't actually use that word yet, but biodiversity. And of course, all of that within the context of the EU biodiversity strategy. So that's a very important and all sorts of other issues and topics and key messages that you heard there, not least that adaptation has to go hand in hand with mitigation. So that takes us beautifully into our first session. And the first session is called Inspiring Action for a climate resilient Europe. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to establish some context and provide some inspiration for adaptation action and societal transformation in Europe. And who better to help us than our two opening speakers. Now, joining us now live online is the chair of the mission on adaptation to climate change, including societal transformation, former European Commissioner for Climate Action, Connie Hedegaard. So welcome 
uh, to you. And also joining me physically at the requisite social distance, I think I must always insist upon that, is of course the Director General of DG Research and Innovation, Jean-Éric Paquet. So it's so delightful to have both of you with me today. A pleasure and a privilege. I've asked you both to be super concise. Uh, I think you know that. Let me start, if I may, with you, please, uh, Jean-Éric Paquet. Now, we heard there, in that clip from Hannah, this is a pivotal moment in human history. So what role exactly do you expect research and innovation to play, and particularly you know, if we look at climate change adaptation research innovation, to deliver both the green and the digital transition that we need for a more climate resilient Europe? What is that critical role? And please address our audience if you like as well, feel free. Katrina, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Yes, research and innovation uh, will be critical. Uh, research and innovation brought the knowledge, science brought the knowledge which has put uh, climate change on the very top of the political agenda here in Europe and increasingly worldwide. And the challenge of climate adaptation combined to climate mitigation, uh, as was already mentioned, will require knowledge brought by science knowledge on the systemic nature of the challenges we face, knowledge on the urgency uh, to act. Um, I think there is nothing more uh, impactful than hearing a scientist explain what we know but forget, that climate change is happening today, that it has major impact on our habitats, on our weather systems, and that time for action is the most urgent. So knowledge will be key, driving also systemic solutions. Climate adaptation, climate mitigation, they combine themselves uh, and they are synergies for more impactful solutions. But increasingly around the green transformation of Europe, we need to find uh, solutions which cut across biodiversity loss, environmental degradation, pollution and climate change, sometimes trade-offs, and here again, the knowledge from science will provide systemic frameworks to allow us to go beyond these trade-offs. So that's the first part of uh, what research provides. And the other one, obviously, are the solutions. Solutions from technology, solutions to experiment in society. Social innovation will be absolutely decisive in uh, ensuring that we can move fast on climate adaptation. And this is where, um, the, um, where ECHA provide such an important knowledge platform because this is all about deploying these solutions in society, in our economies, across uh, the entire European Union. Thank you. And just before I turn to Connie Hedegaard, let me quickly for just a moment ask you, do, have you seen a kind of, you talked urgency there, we know it, we hear it, have you felt and seen a, a, an increase in that momentum, a real, you know, even throughout and, and also perhaps because of this crisis, this green recovery as a way through and beyond COVID? Yeah, we, we are very much seeing it. I think politically it's obvious for all of you. But in, in research and innovation, uh, the Commission uh, organized a, a Green Deal call, 1 billion uh, euros. That was at the end of last year that it was launched. We had more than 1,500 project proposals, 1,500 across Europe with thousands and thousands of, of actors, scientists, but also uh, citizens, civil society, local politicians. They all teamed up and brought these um, amazing solutions. I mean, the budget being limited, we will fund uh, only a handful of these projects, but I very much hope that the mobilization in preparing for the call will allow many of these solutions to be effectively deployed. Thank you. And thank you also because I think there what was so important is this issue of all of those actors in the ecosystem and we're going to be hearing from a lot of them and their voices reflected in some of the examples and the expertise that is being brought before you today. So I've only got 10 minutes in this slot so I must come to Connie Hedegaard next and a very important question for you I think is, is the challenges. You know we're talking and particularly here we're bringing adaptation solutions to life, those are very important words, and building a resilient future. So what for you are those key challenges and how do you expect those Horizon Europe missions and of course particularly the mission on climate adaptation to, to do their part? How do they fit in? What do you expect from those missions? Thank you, Adrian, and uh, good morning everybody. Well, what we really would like to, to see is to combine exactly what Jean-Yves Paquet was just mentioning, 
the, the solutions and the knowledge. If you uh, sort of take the European adaptation strategy, you can see there are some knowledge gaps uh, already mentioned. And this mission could try and sort of make a bridge to provide some of this knowledge, but also to bring all the knowledge we already have into play. And that is why a core piece of our proposal is to work with 200 regions so that the potential solutions and all the knowledge we have can be anchored in reality, can go out there and work in the regions, but also we can get the knowledge from what they need back into the mission. I would say that when it comes to knowledge, you could say that natural science basically check. There are many things we don't know, but there are many things we do know also with the economics of this. But there are so many things still to, to be, be had, uh, knowledge on uh, social innovation, as jean yves Paquet also referred to, but also the behavioral part, the inclusion part, how to leave no one behind, the governance part. There are so many things where we still need both to have more knowledge that is out there somewhere would be in front of those taking decisions in politics and in business and in the investment community when they need it. Thank you. And you've really nicely answered what I was going to ask you, which was to say, could you give us some specific examples of those gaps? And there you sort of came, you know, we really need to push on the social innovation side. We have to really all hands to the deck and keep in mind the just transition that's going to come up again and again today and governance. But, but critically, they're working with 200 regions. I really picked up. And for you, if you had to say in a nutshell, the importance of local action. We really are focusing on that. What would you say in answer to that? Katrina, why is it so important to get all of that local knowledge and combine it with science? Because basically we can talk and talk and talk and write all the nice strategies we want. But in the end, it is out in the local municipalities, it's out in the regions that you really have to deal with this, to implement it in practice. And I think that if we should be faster sometimes in Europe to sort of move from what we know and what we say and what we intend and our fine targets to achieve them, if we, if we want to scale up uh, and speed up, then we need to make the bridge out to those in the local entities sitting there with the real challenges. And I have one hobby horse, and that is we are not good enough at sharing knowledge. We could do much more with open data and with combining what we know about climate to also the digital uh, issues. And there is something we could really help and where EU could be seen as a help uh, with uh, seen from the regions, because that is quite a bite to sit alone out there in a region. Sometimes you do not have too much manpower. We could shortcut faster to better solutions if we were better at sharing data, sharing knowledge, sharing also digital solutions. Thank you very, very much. And the importance of that dynamic between the EU level and the regional and the local, I think you've really pinpointed there, which is very helpful. Um, challenges, let me turn to you and ask you, uh, Jean-Éric Paquet, all about those challenges. What do you think, you heard some of them, uh, that this particular conference and of course the webinars that led up to it are gonna help to address? Well, I think Connie said it very well, and the mission, I think, encapsulates it. It's a mission possible, if, if, if I may. There are a number of other missions as well on cities, on oceans, on soils, which all come together uh, with the mission uh, led uh, by, by Connie Hedegaard on climate adaptation. And they are indeed, a, they are providing a platform to experiment, to connect knowledge with the uh, deployment of solutions, which is very much what uh, ECHA is uh, promoting, has been promoting now, uh, for many years and also a, a platform where and this is one of the real challenges of dealing with climate adaptation is to connect the various levels of uh, policy action the local level where in reality the solutions are deployed in society the national or regional level uh, where a lot of the decision framework also the investment is decided and then of course also the european level where knowledge exchange, um, but also regulation and investment possibilities are provided. So the, the missions allow really to cut across and to demonstrate that research and innovation provides knowledge, effective, concrete, practical solutions 
which are then deployed on the ground. And uh, the mission is for me possible, but it's also necessary against the urgency of this uh, adaptation and uh, mitigation track. Thank you. And, and just building on that, if I might come back to Connie Hedegaard for a last question for you. This, this whole science policy dialogue, which is indispensable, we know that and we see it in all sorts of different initiatives, but ECHA seems to me to be really quite special. So what would you expect from ECHA and from this conference and everything that goes forwards in really helping to strengthen that dialogue to meet some of those challenges that you identified there? Well, I think you have already, through the nine webinars and the conclusions from there, I think you have already helped making a strong case. For instance, as we just heard 10 minutes ago, about sort of the, the pricing, the need to sort of have pricing, the true cost yeah. uh, right, uh, the collaborative approach. And I also noticed that it was very much emphasized the need to empower people. So to sort of tell the story to show what knowledge and science can contribute i think it is absolutely key also to to carry the citizens through the transition that we need to go through in europe thank you very very much and i think uh, you really do again put you know really put your finger on the absolute importance of the link between the eu and the local level because if you don't bring us all along and i include myself in that for the ride and empower us locally and we empower ourselves then well, where are we? So on that note, in order to be uh, the very good uh, moderator I am with the eye on the clock, I'm going to say thank you so much to you, Connie Hedegaard, for joining us today. A warm thanks to you. You've got a hell of a week, have you not, uh, Jean-Éric Paquet? There's a lot going on with the RNI days, so it's been a privilege to have you with me, somebody with me here to kick off this event. So thank you to both of those brilliant opening speakers. And now we have indeed painted the picture, ladies and gentlemen. We've given you some of the bigger stuff behind for the further discussions today. Now, before I take us into that first panel, uh, we're going to hear from two further speakers. Now, the first of those speakers is, of course, from Portugal's presidency of the Council of the EU, uh, João Pedro Matos Fernandes, and he is Minister of the Environment and Climate Action. Let's hear what he has to say. Dear Vice President Timmermans, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a pleasure to join you at this great conference at such a crucial point in the time for climate action. The message from science on the urgency for a climate neutral transformation is now clear, not only in the EU, but across the globe. And there is also an urgent need to adapt to the impacts of climate change. While a complete recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic is the major goal worldwide, it is crystal clear that we must recover better and in line with the Paris Agreement. The momentum is in our favor. Allow me to highlight some crucial elements in the current adaptation debate. Firstly, we have reached the final agreement on the first European climate law that sets a clear framework for climate action and ambition in the EU in line with the Paris Agreement. Steered by the goal of achieving climate neutrality by 2050, the EU and its member states presented an enhanced NDC submission with a higher net domestic target of at least 55% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 compared to 1990. The European Climate Law proposal provides a foundation for increased ambition and policy coherence on adaptation. It sets both the framework for achieving climate neutrality and the ambition on adaptation by 2050 by integrating the international shared vision for action into EU law. The proposal commits the EU and its member states to make continuous progress to boost adaptive capacity, strengthen resilience and reduce vulnerability to climate change. Secondly, the European Commission has published a communication on a new EU strategy on adaptation to climate change that outlines a long-term vision for the EU to become a climate-resilient society that is fully adapted to the unavoidable impacts by climate change till 2050, which is one of the key actions identified in the European Green Deal. Given the systemic nature of adaptation policy, 
adaptation action will be implemented in an integrated manner with other European Green Deal's initiatives such as <coughs> the biodiversity strategy, the farm to fork strategy or the upcoming EU forest strategy. As one of the European countries most affected by climate change, mainly due to the impacts of droughts and water scarcity, we elected adaptation as the main priority of the current Portuguese presidency of the EU Council. Finally, at the Environment Council of the 10th of June, ministers adopt Council conclusions on forging a climate-resilient Europe with the aim of capturing the essential elements of all the different dimensions at the new strategy while reflecting the concerns and priorities expressed during the discussions within the Council in a balanced manner. You ministers welcome the strategy's emphasis on nature-based solutions, on adaptation action at the local level, on the need for enhanced adaptation mainstreaming and for the necessary financing for adaptation measures. The strategy's new international dimension, its focus on improving knowledge about risk assessment and on integration of adaptation into macro fiscal policies were also appreciated. These conclusions aim to provide political guidance to the Commission as regards the implementation of the strategy, including guidance for the preparation of an EU adaptation communication with a view to its submission in time for the UN's Climate Change Conference in Glasgow. The EU is prepared to contribute to an ambitious outcome from the COP26 and has been working intensively in delivering enhanced climate action and ambition across the borough. At the national level, Portugal has taken important steps to build capacity on adaptive management at subnational level. We are proud to have almost all our territory covered with local adaptation plans where action can be better fit to the local circumstances. Recently, we have started to work on the National Roadmap for Adaptation 2100 to evaluate the vulnerability of the Portuguese territory. We will systematize and update knowledge for different scenarios of global temperature increase, including the costs of inaction. It is well known that inaction far exceeds the cost of adaptation. Ambition on adaptation is not an extravagance. It is inevitable to deal with the impacts of climate change. We can use the required investments to boost resilience, economic recovery and improve quality of life but also to balance the intergenerational climate justice, improving the outlook for future generations and achieving equitable climate resilience in such a way that all the most vulnerable groups can be integrated into this climate action in a fair way. We hope to help providing the best engaging environment to foster ambition and implementation of adaptation actions ensuring our part on the necessary progress towards the global goal on adaptation set out in the Paris Agreement with more adaptive capacity and resilience to climate change. Thank you. So thank you very much to the Minister there and I think it was very important to hear him of course just name check those very critical EU strategies we heard about farm to fork strategy, biodiversity that I'd mentioned earlier, of course the forest strategy. So it's important to just embed all of that context for our discussions and I heard right at the start there he said momentum is in our favour and the importance so much again of boosting the adaptive capacity and management not least at local level. So there's another video uh, just to get you really your uh, brain matter stimulated before we move into our first panel discussion. And so we're going to listen to some salient points now from the Executive Secretary of the UN FCC, Patricia Espinosa. Have a listen. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to the EU for organizing this high-level event on advancing adaptation action and for the series of webinars focusing on adaptation research and innovation leading to this conference. It's not easy to find rays of hope in such a challenging year, 
but it's encouraging to see adaptation assuming a more prominent position in discussions on climate action. This couldn't happen without your efforts. To the researchers, innovators, government officials, and to all of you working so hard on adaptation and resilience issues, let me say this. Your work is instrumental and never have we needed it more. We are still at the beginning of this journey. As we heard at the Climate Adaptation Summit in January, the world remains behind on adaptation planning, finance and implementation. And it is increasingly clear that adaptation will be one of the central pieces with respect to achieving success at COP26. The new EU adaptation strategy shows that the EU understands this and is moving in the right direction. It's a significant step in fulfilling the adaptation-related goals of the Paris Agreement and building a more climate-resilient future in the EU and beyond. It stresses the importance of the global goal on adaptation and adaptation finance. And it strengthens support for the development and implementation of nationally determined contributions and national adaptation plans. But I, as I told EU ministers, one key to success in adaptation and resilience, like so many other issues related to climate change, remains adequate finance. Huge gaps remain with respect to financing for adaptation in developing countries. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has called for 50% of the total share of climate finance provided by all developed countries and multilateral development banks to be allocated to adaptation and resilience in developing countries. The African Development Bank set the bar in 2019 by allocating over half of its climate finance to adaptation. We need others to follow this example. It's why the UN urges all donors and multilateral development banks to commit to this goal by COP26 and deliver on it at least by 2024. Again, we still have a long way to go, but I encourage the EU to rise to the challenge and to meet that COP26 commitment. COP26 also offers us the opportunity to strengthen national adaptation plans or NAPs, an area EU ministers have identified as crucial. It is as true for developing nations as it is for those in Europe. Many are putting together their very first NAPs. Working with developing nations to develop those NAPs is important, but just as important, again, is the finance necessary to implement and carry out actions that will fulfill their adaptation goals. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank the EU for its leadership on adaptation, and I thank all those who participated in the webinars and provided their expertise and support on this issue. This work provides a beacon for others to follow. The Secretary General has said, adaptation cannot be the forgotten half of the climate equation. And I encourage you to continue your efforts to ensure it remains at the forefront of climate action and as we continue to build a more climate resilient world. Thank you. And thank you for those very wise words, very passionate words, and that very, very clear message there from Patricia Espinosa. And, and just to, to reiterate again, there's all of those dimensions at play. We know that, not least the international dimension. We heard from the minister, we heard from Patricia. And Patricia there saying that in terms of adaptation, we're still at the beginning of our journey. There are gaps in financing. There is a lot to be done if we are to meet the adaptation goals set down in the Paris Climate Agreement. So all of that on the table up for discussion.
And that takes us very, very nicely into our first panel. And our first panel is inspiring climate adaptation action for transformation in Europe and, critically, beyond. And so let's see if we can have a sneak peek on screen to just see who our speakers are in this session. Hopefully you can just have a look at their names there. Just take a moment. We've got a great, great lineup in this first panel. But it's not for me to moderate this first panel, actually. I have great pleasure to hand over to the first of my fellow moderators at today's event. It's Dr. Frank McGovern. Uh, who is the current chair of JPI Climate, who, as I said, are absolutely instrumental in bringing ECHA to life and its journey beforehand. Now, Frank McGovern is working as the chief climate scientist for Ireland's Environmental Protection Agency and leads Ireland's engagement with the IPCC. So a warm welcome to you. Now, I wasn't sure if you're Professor Dr. Frank McGovern or Doctor, so do forgive me if I didn't put enough titles in there. But let me just ask you, what are you hoping to get out of this discussion with your panellists, just in a nutshell. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Kat, and I'm not really worried about the titles. I, I do think we've heard some really valuable insights so far, and from the panel, I think we will start to hear how the high-level thinking uh, can be translated into practical transformational solutions and actions. As you say, from a global to a local scale, yeah. all, all solutions are indeed local, but this is a very global issue. Thank you so very much. I'm going to give you 30 minutes to orchestrate your chat and I'm going to pop back at the end once you've released your speakers and just have a quick exchange with you. So have a lovely time, stimulating time, and I hand the floor to you, Frank. Thank you. And I would like to ask the speakers to join me. And Thank you very much. I'm delighted to see you all on the screens in front of me. These virtual meetings are always quite, uh, how shall I put it, um, challenging in, 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 in where we are right now. So I, I'll get straight into it. I, I think uh, I, I'll just go, go, first, I would like to, uh, I suppose, introduce Mia Petra Kampala Natri. Mia Petra, you are a member of the European Parliament, which is a key pillar of the European Union. The European Union, as we've heard, has a pivotal role in enhancing climate actions. Primarily, of course, it's for its citizens, but also as a global actor and a global partner. How, from your perspective, is this being advanced, Mia Petra? Thank you. Thank you for the introducing. And, and we heard earlier the, the Portuguese presidency of the Council, and there the European Parliament is a companion to do the legislation, to accept the finance. And then we are talking and representing directly European citizens, all 705 of us. So for the climate and biodiversity crisis is acute. We have a, a parliament says that we are in a crisis. So uh, according to the European State of the Climate Report, last winter was one of the three warmest years on the record globally. And in Europe, annual temperature was highest on the record. I come from Finland, from the north, and uh, the northeastern Europe was nearly 1.9 uh, degrees warmer than the previous record, with low ice sea cover on our Baltic Sea and low number of days with snow in some areas. Uh, also, during the spring, UNEP launched the first synthesis report on climate, biodiversity and pollution emergencies, and it stated that the world is on the track for warming at least three degrees above pre-industrial by 2100, so missing the Paris Agreement target. So all this is just telling us politicians and citizens and uh, investors and the whole world that we need to act and do it right away. So uh, adaptation for me is not giving up, but it is the part of the strategy and need to be taken on board as very well re referred to the speech by Guterres. 
In Europe, the European climate law was represented here, and it is setting us on the path of at least 55 cuts in this decade. And the fifth for 55 packets will be soon launched by the Commission for the legislators to tackle really uh, and, and align with these targets the real action, for example, on energy. Uh, I think the EU member states and most, at least most, and the European Parliament majority as well as the European businesses are ready to act towards the climate neutrality. Green Deal strategy is uh, taking climate on board, but it's still the growth strategy. So we want people to have new jobs and well-being even um, during the fight, the climate. But even though we would succeed radically to cut emissions, with the globe will face warming and we need to prepare also for that. So adaptation for the climate strategy is welcome proposal. Uh, what I want to emphasize is that we have to scale the international fin finance also. The European Investment Bank is really a green bank and I hope more continents to join because we have counted that meeting this 55% emission reduction uh, Europe would need annually 350 billion higher uh, investments that we are doing at the moment. And I see good uh, will also on the private funding not to have stranded assets, but the invested on something that is still used in, in the decades to come. So uh, for the technology which was referred here, I would like to uh, use the word handprint. We do have a negative carbon footprint in our vocabulary, but we should also have the positive handprint. It can be the digitalization, the tools and powers of data, but it can be many other innovations that is needed. Mostly we talk about technological innovations, but we have to have the social cleverness to keep everyone on board. And that's why I also think working with the 200 regions as presented, Mr. Hedegaard, is important. Member states are different, continents are different, and the regions are different. And every people is the same. We want to live in the globe that is healthy and, and secure for us, even the, the warmer uh, warming happens. So I would like to have these words to, to with you to get started to talk what we can do together with the people and regions. Really, thank you. Thank you very much for those inspiring words. And I know that you have to, to, to leave us uh, quite uh, early today because of other engagements. But from your perspective, before you go, have you, have you a message for ECA? How do you see or have you a request from ECA uh, in terms of taking the next steps? Everything starts with the first step. We've taken the first steps, the next steps. Uh, if I have to choose one word, that would be dialogue. Because I don't want people to think that it, I'm losing something. People need hope and they need uh, to be on a part of it. So kind of inclusive way to do that. How my house how my neighborhood, how my children, what, uh, what about my job? So actually, even this is a global phenomena, the whole climate is a global issue. It comes to our everyday life. And it, if people only have the, the fear, uh, it might uh, not get the best results. When we have an understanding of the seriousness, and then we want to do actions. So how we, if we want all act, then we could uh, have very good results. And I'm, I'm hopeful now when I hear the private investors, the big money all. Okay, I think, I think uh, we've, uh, we've lost Mia Petra there, but I think we got the, the key messages there. So I'll go straight to you, Vasco Cordiero. Uh, excuse me uh, for uh, messing up your name slightly, but uh, you are president of the region of the regional governments of the Azores and vice president of, of the European Committee on the Regions. Uh, Vasco, you, you work with the regions and therefore closer to where the practical steps are being taken. What are your priority issues and are these shared across regions? 
Well, good morning, and thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I, I think the main priorities um, uh, we, we could we we could um, we could put them uh, like um, like this. First, regions are one of the key actors implementing policies to tackle uh, climate change. Uh, not only are we one of the first institutions to be confronted with people's awareness of what we have to do, what we must do, what public institutions need to address, but also we are the ones that have a very clear, uh, 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 very clear uh, path to uh, address, uh, 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 to address these issues. So I think the, I think the idea of placing um, climate change as a priority at EU level was at kind of a trickle down effect. It, it, it raised the awareness of, uh, of, um, of everybody. So in, in what's related with regions and local authorities, there are uh, two issues that considering the awareness and considering the willingness to, uh, to address this issue, I would I would refer. First, um, we must be aware that um, we, we must consider in the way we address these issues, the very different situation across Europe within regions and local authorities, not only about the, their competencies, but also about the situation that each one, um, each one is facing. For example, I'm from the Azores, where uh, Nine Island Archipelago spread along uh, 600 kilometers in the North Atlantic. Of course, we have different challenges in what's concerned with climate change that a region that is placed in the middle of the European continent. So we have to address that. I think it's important to, to, to have in mind that one size does not fit all. Second, it's very, very important that the opportunities for us to deliver are duly contemplated at the European level. What I mean by that is we need to have access to funding. We need to have access to the instruments that make us available to this kind of action that makes possible for us to deliver in this kind of uh, action. The, the, um, the next generation EU, the MFF, they both have a minimum allocation of funds toward the Green Deal goals. But local and regional authorities, their needs, their poss the possibilities for them to intervene should also be uh, taking in account in the designing of these funds. So I would put this as the two main priorities. First, the awareness is raised, that's good. Second, we need to consider the differentiation between regions and local authorities. Third, we need to have access to funding so we can deliver. Great, thanks for your very clear answers there. And, you know, uh, I suppose, how, how does this all join up? Who should lead at the various scales from your perspective? Well, I, I think the subsidiarity principle is a very good lead uh, to, to answer that question. But it's very, very important that we consider that it's not only a question of implementing, and I think I should stress this, you cannot design policies at European and national level and then expect regions only to, um, regions and local authorities only to implement that. We, you should take in account at the drawing, drawing of those policies, at the design of those policies, also the regional and local level. That's why I said previously in my answer that um, one size does not fit all. So 
from the early beginning of designing policies, you should take in account the local and regional um, uh, perspective, the local and regional challenges. Uh, just me, let me add something. The Committee of the Regions in 2020 gathered more than 200 best practices across regions in what's related with climate change actions, with climate change policies. So this is a huge potential not only for local and regional authorities to have this exchange of best practices, but also to have a, I wouldn't say micro-targeted, but kind of a local, a regional targeted approach where the national level has the, 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 the power and the responsibility to give some coherence, to give some some logic to all the actions, but to have local and regional authorities addressing this issue with means, reinforced means. So to answer your question, I think it's, um, we cannot only say that the, 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 the intervention of local and regional authorities is important. We also need to have the national and European level acting so we can have some logic, some some coherence between all the interventions. Great, and I, I think that echoes a point that Mia Petra said about the dialogue, that essential dialogue. What I'd like to do is to is to move now to Yusuf Nassif. Yusuf, uh, you lead on the adaptation issues within the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So welcome, Yusuf. I hope you have recovered from three weeks of virtual UN meetings, and. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'd like to do is just to take a, take a look at the global level. The climate convention has been in place since the 1990s. How is it making a practical difference at a global level? Um, thanks, Frank. I think um, the biggest change, the difference that has um, that has been instituted through this whole international process has been the move from disparity to parity. We might not be there yet, but we've created great strides in doing this. A lot of research has been stimulated um, through the work of the Climate Convention and the IPCC. And um, we've, we've seen an evolution of mindset from the early days where um, climate change was env an environmental matter. It moved to being a developmental matter. Now we have um, a mindset that it is an existential matter requiring a massive transformation. Um, we've, um, we've heard from the science that uh, now we have just a few years to act for that transformation. So we've entered into that phase where it's not just a piecemeal approach or let's move incrementally, but we've transformed the thinking within the climate process, both for mitigation and for adaptation, that we are now on that verge of having to transform considerably. And we've heard a lot of that in, in uh, the interventions by, by previous speakers. Now note that uh, if, if you read the convention, which entered into force in 1994, you'll find actually very little reference to adaptation per se. If you read the Paris Agreement, now, Article 7 deals with adaptation in total. And out of its three sub-paragraphs, um, um, it's nine sub-paragraphs, sorry, you have seven that deals with adaptation in the whole world, not just developing countries. And so it's a matter for everyone. Um, there's a more holistic approach to dealing with adaptation. There's a more integrated approach. Transboundary aspects are coming to the fore, and I think the, the, the European um, Union is taking this um, to heart in, in the strategy. And so um, I think that the transformation here has been mostly one of, of mindset, of advancing science, and of pouring in of a lot more resources, coupled with an evolution towards making a business case for adaptation. So finding opportunities for the private sector to come into it, and the other side of the coin, um, a much higher acknowledgement of the value of uh, traditional methods, local coping strategies, indigenous values, indigenous practices that are now being uh, employed by scientists to move us forward into uh, that context of a resilient world. So these are, are the, the changes that I, I see in adaptation. And you might recall back in 1992, um, uh, Al Gore had, had characterized adaptation as being um, a form of, of laziness and an acceptance of, of loss 
whereas two decades later, he characterized them as a moral Im imperative. So that really shows clearly how our mindset has evolved over, over time, and with it, action and science and, uh, and the attention towards parity that has been given to adaptation. Yusuf, yeah, no, thanks, and thanks for, for, I suppose, highlighting that transformation of thinking that has happened. But mm -hmm. Yusuf, you, you, you live in Europe, you're based in Bonn, uh, but you also work globally. Can you say, what, what, what can Europe learn from global actions, and what can, uh, globally, what can Europe bring to the global stage? I can ask mm -hmm. you to, in a nutshell, respond to that. Um. Okay, in, in, in thinking of that, I would say um, um, some of the, of, of the successful actions globally, especially uh, at community level in, in many developing countries, relate to, um, to the, the worldview again. So if you look at indigenous communities, the concept of connectivity, collectivity, intergenerational equity, and how um, the communities look at um, seven generations to come, for example. How do we translate that into modern society? One aspect which, which you studied a lot is revisiting the context of discount rates and, and cost-benefit analysis, for example, and how that can prevent us from looking more into the long term. And so there's some aspects of worldview that can be derived from traditional communities worldwide, especially in, 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 in poorer nations where this can contribute to um, to, to adjusting for that transformation we're talking about. Second, uh, instruments of solidarity at local level. We've seen very successful um, mechanisms for social protection and solidarity, studying how that works culturally, socially, et cetera, and looking at how this can be replicated in modern societies is, is an aspect that I find very fascinating. Um, finally, there are tools that, um, that are now evolving in the whole world um, with support um, from, from Europe and other developed countries um, relating to early action, things like forecast-based finance, things like sovereign insurance schemes, um, early action, and, um, and the successes there can provide a lot of insight into scaling up and, and replicating into um, other parts of the world. Now, um, the one thing that fascinates me about, about the European adaptation strategy that can be um, used as, um, as, as, as a guide for the rest of the world is um, already the integration of transboundary um, aspects into the strategy. As we scale up adaptation, we know that um, th there's no island there, but each action by a country can benefit from joint action with its neighbors or can influence in many, in many ways, positively or negatively, other um, countries and um, and transboundary uh, aspects can can be can be related to uh, to uh, shared ecosystems can be related to human mobility or supply chains etc and this is one thing that um, that uh, the world can learn from Europe number two the holistic aspects of it uh, the integrated view of adaptation and how it links to everything else we've heard a lot now um, about the link to to biodiversity and that's certainly one of the things. Um, uh, and the importance of, uh, of uh, nature-based solutions. But also what I find uh, important is the long-term orientation of the thinking in Europe. There's a, a vision for 2050, and that means that we look at the future, not just as, um, as the present pl plus a climate uh, signal. There's a lot of foresight thinking, foresight scenario planning that goes on, looking at how the techno-economic paradigm shift that will happen in the coming years, AI, uh, big data, blockchain, biotechnology, satellite technology, et cetera, it creates a totally different context. And I think that thinking is already going on in Europe and has to be transmitted um, to, to, to the rest of the world as well, so that we don't adopt a rear view, rear view mirror mentality, but rather a look ahead one where we are solving the problems of the future, not just the problems of today, or preempting them. Um, and, and recreating uh, the world in the best form that it can be given that technological transition as well, not just the environmental one, and taking account of the linkages uh, among sectors, but with other um, symptoms of, um, of ecological degradation that we're moving on. So these are things that I think the world can, 
uh, learned from Europe, the collectivity, the transboundary nature, including of sharing data, having a common knowledge base, having a common data set, um, creating uh, opportunities for open data through uh, Copernicus and other um, initiatives, etc. Thank, thank you indeed, Yusuf, and thanks for that very, very inspiring uh, perspective on Europe. What I'll do right now is go straight to, to Sandrine, who is co-president of the Club of Rome, and uh, great to have you here with us, Sandrine. Uh, I, in the end, th this, is, this, this is about bringing people with us, as we've heard uh, at the start, and what motivates them to, to achieve these visions. From, from your perspective, um, have, we got, have we got it right? Is the enabling environment right? We've heard all about it, but is it, are there still barriers? And what, what, what can we need, what do we need to overcome any barriers that are, may still be there? Sandrine, Thank you, please. Frank. And um, yes, there are many barriers. I mean, I think that the key barriers, let's remember that adaptation is the poor cousin on climate action. And yet we know that if we're going to build resilience to future shocks, adaptation must work hand in hand with mitigation. So the first key barrier is the psychological barrier and the fact that we actually have not placed adaptation at the center of our policy, even if we have this great new mission at the European level. So this must mean that we stop investing in stranded assets across sectors, all the way from energy to agriculture, but we bring in the adaptation element along the way. And that means that we need to invest in nature-based solutions, that we need to understand that protecting nature also can mitigate. It is both an adaptation mechanism as well as a mitigation mechanism because it is taking in our carbon stocks. But it also means that we have to create the underbelly for both innovation, research, and short-term levers for change. And that means adopting the ambitious policies that we actually need, not only at the European level, and yes, we are moving with the European Green Deal, with the mission, as I indicated, but with so many other policies. But we need to ensure, and this is where some of our compass work has come in, that this is systemic in approach, that we adopt a holistic approach to the way in which we look at climate action. Because to reach 2030 climate and nature targets, we actually need to act now. That means putting in, as I said, those short-term levers that are going to enable us to truly act. And, and it also means that we need to look at how GDP is going to shift because what we need to think about is nature has to be placed at the core of our balance sheets. It needs to be placed at the core of the way in which we look at indicators for economic development, not just for growth. We're having discussions, for example, with the G20 and, pure, and before with the G7 around the need to actually integrate nature into all decision-making and all financial mechanisms, but also to ensure that we cost exter externalities in our budgets. So let's turn to the budgets. What we're looking at now, obviously, is the greatest recovery plan we've ever seen in history. We have to recover from COVID. This is a moment to tap into the consciousness of what is most essential, to shift our budgets into placing a value on nature, placing a value on climate, placing a value on people's lives and livelihoods. And you talked about how do we bring people on the journey. Now, let's remember what Sharon Burroughs says from the International Trade Union Confederation. There are no jobs on a dead planet. It's very simple. We need to ensure, therefore, that the nature that we have, that our planetary boundaries are given the same economic value that we place on money, that we place on frivolity, that we place on material goods. We need to decouple our resources to ensure that we actually do truly create the resilience that we need. So that means now we have certain instruments at hand that can help us. We have the taxonomy and we need an ambitious science-based taxonomy that places adaptation and mitigation at the forefront. And I'm sorry to say that with the current results and the pushback that we had on forestry, biodiversity and agriculture, that really we did not put that ambition that we needed within our current taxonomy. We are now working on a new taxonomy that hopefully will continue to look at environmental objectives and place them right smack at the center of what green actually means. But in addition to that, and I'm gonna close with this, 
We have to remember that if we don't build resilience and adaptation across our economies now, that we don't place actually new investments, that 37% that's supposed to go into climate, also on adaptation, that we will not create the resilient economies that we need. And for the moment, the recovery plans that we have seen are still far too short on nature-based solutions, far too short on adaptation. So we need to design <clears throat> the future. And designing the future means that we need to ensure the convergence to a truly transformative research and innovation policy that will drive and enable the sustainable transition. We need to ensure that we put in place a prepare, protect, and transform policy, which we have yes, proposed through this year, and that we put it, that in place in order to really have a new economic and environmental policy and a social policy that is truly the underbelly of our transformation. Okay, thank you. I will uh, just stay where I am now and I assume that I'll be transferred in, right? I Yes, sorry, a voice was okay. coming in here from, from the ether to my ears. So really, t t t thank you, Sandrine. And, and I think you've articulated a really exciting vision of transition transformation. How do we do it all so urgently and radically in one go, in a, in a, in a nutshell? Well, we won't have one goal. We need to have linked up, joined up policymaking. We need to have optimized policymaking. We have our, our horizon funding. We have our mission for adaptation. And in particular, we also have the European Green Deal. But what we need is we need to get smarter and we need to have brave leadership at the member state level here at Europe and at the global level in different countries. We have a decade of action, but that also means that we can be creative. If we take the post COVID recovery and learn from COVID, we've heard how communities were able to totally transform themselves in one year. Can we please learn from that transformation? An indication that actually we can transform and work with people to indicate to them that this is the greatest time in history to ensure that actually climate change, health pandemics and biodiversity loss are not the greatest existential risk, but the best way for us to bounce forward better. Okay, this COVID is the springboard for this transformation. I, what I'd like to do, Sandrine, is just bring in uh, Vasco. Have you any final reflections or anything you've heard? Yes, thank you. Just, just to stress this point that this is a huge opportunity. We're not talking about to get back at the point where we were in March 2020 or in January 2020. This is the opportunity to change to to of course the pandemic had very too much negative impact but it brings us this opportunity to gather a huge amount of resources the ability or the awareness that we need to take exceptional extraordinary actions to put us in the place, including in climate change adaptation, to put us in the place where we should be some years ago, it is correct. But this huge opportunity, I think, should not be missed. And only with this um, motivation, only with this awareness, I think it's possible to, to, um, to have things done. So the idea of the opportunity, I don't want to use the term final opportunity. But I don't see many other opportunities in the future where you can gather the awareness, the financial resources, and the ability to do something. So this is the time. We have to deliver. Thank you. The time is now. Yusuf, you have one minute. Totally agree. I mean, looking at this as an opportunity and springboard for moving to a, to, to a vastly different future that does not continue to spur out uh, ecological problems is where we are, we have the opportunity of the technological transformation. It can help us lead to that micro-targeting that Mr. Cordero mentioned in terms of mass customization. It is the level of the human being that we are trying to advance, but with the use of the appropriate policy instruments. And so, yes, we are on the cusp of that uh, transformational opportunity that will help us 
move into a resilient society, not just to climate change, and things have to be seen holistically, take care of the global commons, the ecosystems, indigenous peoples, and move us to that other place. So totally agree with what was said. Thank you. Sandrine, final, final word to you. Thank you, Frank. I'll just say that we have to remember that really putting adaptation and nature-based solutions first can unlock socioeconomic benefits. We can unlock an estimated 10 trillion in business opportunities by transforming our ecosystems. 80% of nature loss will be actually stopped and reversed. We can have climate benefits. Natural climate solutions can deliver an estimated 11 gigatons of emissions reductions per year. And we can have health benefits, which can also reduce costs by 84%. So let's be clear. Yes, the opportunities are there. It's time to act. And together, I am absolutely convinced that we can. But we don't have any more time. Thank you. OK, thanks to everybody. Really, that was a really excellent panel, I must say. Really inspiring. Thank you all. Uh, and I would hand back now to Kat. Hello, thank you so much, uh, Frank. I would absolutely agree with you. I was listening to every word. It was super inspiring. Can I just say a few of my favorites and then I'm gonna ask what really resonated for you? Because I've been, can I just show? I don't know if the camera can see. I've been scribbling like a nut there. Look, I was just so, so many excellent things. Not least what I heard there um, from um, the committee of the regions. You know, don't expect the regions just to implement stuff. You know, everything has to be shaped. It shouldn't just be shaped nationally or at EU level. Get the regions in there. Get the local dimension in there. That's how it gets done on the ground. Do not forget the social alongside the technological innovation. We heard there from Mia Petra Kumpula Natri something so important. If you want to carry people along with you, they need hope, not just fear. So they have to understand the relevance. What does this mean for my house, my neighborhood, my job, my kids? Absolutely from Sandrine, I love her. She's been on panels of mine before, that passion. We need brave leadership. There are no jobs on a dead planet. And let's just not talk about risk to nature. Let's talk about nature at the very heart of bringing transformation. Now I've hoovered up your minutes, Frank. What really stood out for you? What really hit you in that first uh, panel? What struck me was the, the inspirational tone of it all and the essence of the message was it's about people, it's about yeah. dialogue, it's connection and it's, there are solutions and we need to start using those solutions, we know what they are and we need to have to put the systems in place at all the scales and those systems need to be connected. Leadership is needed, we can get leadership. And before I go, I suppose what I'd like to make a, a a short announcement, if you don't mind. Uh, ECA 2021 has been excellent. And Ireland hopes uh, that it will host ECA 2023, where we can actually see the progress on all of these issues over the coming two years. So I'll hand back to you and thank all of our panel members again for their contributions. Thank you, Frank. And you're absolutely right, because this is a journey. Thank you to all of those brilliant speakers in the first panel. And you are right to say this is um, this is a beauty in action, work in motion. This is dialogue that continues. So thank you for um, just putting another upcoming milestone in this journey uh, in there. Now, another, if you are tweeting, please tweet, go on. Let's get ECA 2021 trending. Come on, this is the time. Listen to Youssef Nassef, what did he say there? I can see a move from disparity to parity, an evolution of mindset from the environmental to the developmental, it's an existential matter and the mindset is advancing science and vice versa so come on there's some brilliant quotes you need to get them out there but first I'm going to ask you to get busy in another way so Twitter aside let's look at a first Slido poll and remember slido.com hashtag echo 2021 there it is what do we need to do what do we need to step up climate adaptation action is it a question of data and scientific knowledge and communication? Is it a question of science-informed policymaking for those brave leaders that Sandrine was talking about? Is it about more public and private investments? Or is it 
all of the above. So let's see what you think is the most important, but we're not going to look at the results quite yet. I'm going to give you a chance to input into that Slido poll there, uh, first of all. But I'd like to uh, have another video. That would be delightful. So after this video message, you're going to hear the results. And the next one is from the UK Minister of State, the COP26 International Champion for Adaptation and Resilience, Anne-Marie Trevelyan. So let's hear some wise words from her. Thank you. Hello everyone. I'm delighted to be speaking to you all today at the European Climate Change Adaptation Conference. I'm really sorry that I can't be there in person. We know that this is a vital year for climate action and at COP26 we will be putting adaptation and resilience issues front and centre. This means amplifying action to adapt and build resilience worldwide and increasing efforts to avert, to minimise and to address loss and damage. At the heart of this must be strengthened collaboration across borders and societies, with businesses and civil society. With the impacts of COVID-19 being felt across the world, we will also need to work together to scale up finance from all sources and improve access to it. As part of this, we are keen to encourage governments to produce national adaptation plans and adaptation communications. The UK produced an adaptation communication in December last year, and I hope more countries will be able to do the same in the run-up to COP. I wear two hats in the UK government, as Minister for Energy, Clean Growth and Climate Change, and as COP26 International Champion on Adaptation and Resilience. Since I began the champion role at the end of last year, I've talked to climate experts and politicians across the world. As I have done so, it has become increasingly clear how urgently we need to take action to respond to those growing climate risks, especially for women and girls, those indigenous and marginalised peoples. They are disproportionately impacted by climate shocks and they are at the front line of those climate shocks, but they are also change makers at the forefront of driving action. So we must do more to make sure their voices are heard that our solutions consider their needs and that we learn from their experience and leadership. Here in the UK, we are working hard to develop our climate resilience. An example of this is the UK Climate Change Risk Assessment, which pulls together evidence from across our academic community to present a clear picture of the challenges faced by different sectors. This work is rooted in innovative science such as our UK climate projections, which offer unprecedented detail on how the climate may change over time. This research from world-class UK institutions is complemented by a track record of working collaboratively across the globe, delivering impact by harnessing the power of research and innovation to transform lives. We know that no single solution will be enough and that it is important to have a range of practical approaches. This focus on practical solutions is one of the core aims of the Adaptation Action Coalition that was launched this year in partnership with our co-chair, Egypt. It builds on the 2019 UN Climate Ambition Summit, where we co-led the call for action on adaptation and resilience. The AAC is taking a sector-specific approach, driving targeted progress in priority areas such as water, health and infrastructure. The AAC's recent water event launched a water tracker, which will support seven countries initially to mainstream water climate risks into finance, environment and water ministries in order to de-risk and leverage investments. We are also launching the Adaptation Research Alliance, a new international research collaboration that has the potential to transform how adaptation research is targeted, coordinated and conducted. The ARA will have diversity, inclusion and southern leadership at its heart and will develop solutions that are driven by the needs of local communities. I hope that some of you will feel able to join the AAC and the ARA over the next few months and I look forward to working very closely with those of you who do. These are just a few examples of the work that the UK is leading on in the area of adaptation and resilience. I hope very much that today's conference inspires more ideas for climate adaptation action and I look forward to hearing about the solutions that have been discussed. Thank you. A warm thank you to Anne-Marie Trevelyan there and also for putting that 
focus on what do we mean when we talk about a just transition, the importance of inclusion, and who are some of the very vulnerable groups and people that we include. So let's just have a look if we can see the results of Slido. Can we see the results of that first question? What do we need to step up climate adaptation action? Well, it doesn't surprise me. I don't think it's going to surprise you to see at the moment that 58% of the people really do think science-informed policy making more public and private investments and better data, scientific knowledge and communication all have a very key role to play to do it. And uh, just to make sure that Sandri as Sandrine said at the, uh, at the end of uh, the previous uh, session, adaptation should no longer be seen as the poor cousin. I think those were her words. So thank you for that. Now, don't go away, ladies and gentlemen. Don't sit back and relax because I'd like to ask you to take part in a second poll now. And this is a slightly different one. Who do you want to connect to? Who do you want to connect with on the topic of climate resilience? Who do you want to connect with? Is it the, the academic uh, uh, community, researchers and innovators? Is it the public authorities and the investors, the policy makers? Are we looking at the private side, industry and private investors? Or is it citizens, people, civil society. So who do you really want to connect with on the topic of climate resilience? Again, we'll see the results in just a moment because we've got a really, really lovely animation now for you. It's a message that's been sent in an animation from uh, Roger Street, the University of Oxford. He is director of the UK Climate Impacts Programme and he's also a champion of one of the webinars, Webinar 4, which was on climate knowledge and information as enablers of climate action. So uh, have a look at this really lovely clip. Thank you. I think that gives you all a very, very good idea of all of the work that went into and behind the scenes of those nine webinars. And of course, don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, that all of those materials are available in the library of the ECA 2021 website. So do go and have a look. Now, it's our moment to check in with the results of the poll that I just, uh, that I just launched about who you want to connect with. Let's have a look uh, at the moment. You are most interested in connecting with public authorities and investors and policy makers. So it's that whole angle, both at, I would say, EU, national, regional, local level. Uh, citizens, people, we've heard how important it is that all of this should be relevant and accessible in terms of coming up with local solutions. Industry and private investors. And ah, I'll be asking our next moderator about that. And 6% of people said want to connect with academia, research, and uh, innovators. So very interesting results there. Thank you so much for getting busy. And again, I'm going to pester you. Don't forget to tweet. Now, just before I take us into this last panel before a short coffee break, let's hear again some key messages from the ECHO webinars, and this time from champion Giulia Galluccio. Video, please. My name is Giulia Galluccio, and I work at the Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change Foundation. Italian member of the Joint Programming Initiative Connecting Climate Knowledge for Europe. Together with JPI Climate, I had the honor to champion the climate adaptation finance team of ECA21. 
The way we do business today will not deliver effective adaptation. Finding new ways to integrate the true cost of our economic actions on society and environment is critical to avoid further harm. Europe has the opportunity to redesign the financial system to deliver value for its citizens and to finance and support adaptation action in partner countries experiencing the impacts of climate change. GECA community invites you to reimagine climate change adaptation. What's your vision the society you want to live in? What are you doing as an individual, as a business, as a leader to achieve this vision? What are you prepared to do? The ECA community invites you to collaborate with us to integrate wider social, economic and environmental goals into our efforts to manage climate risk. And thank you very, very much there to Julia. And what I heard there, what's your vision uh, of these 10 beautifully crafted messages that came out of the nine webinars leading up to this event? That was one of them. In fact, message two. Uh, we'll hear more about that in a moment, but uh, that's given you some lovely context for the upcoming panel and uh, sharing knowledge on climate adaptation science inspires action is what it's all gonna be about. And let's now have a quick sneak peek at who is going to be speaking at this second panel and inspiring you all at home and in your offices. There you go. So just take a moment to uh, have a look who we've got on this next panel. And now it's a great pleasure for me to hand over to the moderator of the panel. She's an environmental scientist, a policy advisor, and a science communicator. And she is also director of Change by Degrees. This is an award-winning business that advises organizations on sustainability strategy and reporting, how to engage employees, and also on sustainability communication. She is the lovely Dr. Tara Schein. So a very, very warm welcome to you. So lovely to have you with us. Now, I just want to say this is so much your baby. You have done an inordinate amount of work up until this point, so I hope you can see some of that coming to fruition here. What did you think about the results of that poll there, when the most important was to connect with the policy makers, um, the local authorities, and we had the 6% with the academia and the researchers? How did you read that? Thanks, Katrina. Well, I was thrilled because I think from the very outset, um, the whole group that has worked on organising ECA, led by JPI Climate, has wanted this conference to be about action on the ground. And the truth of the matter is that to get to action on the ground, we have to engage with policy makers, with investors, with those making the decisions that shape day-to-day -day life. So I'm really pleased. I think this uh, really reflects the focus we want to have today on getting well past planning to figure out how do we accelerate adaptation action. And I did say there that, that part of the work that was done in those webinars was coming out with these messages that are very much, I mean, a work in progress, are they not? They're, they're going to nourish the journey going forward to the COP26. But um, what do you think you're going to focus on? What's your intention in this panel? And what other message, messages do you think might come out? So this panel is all around sharing knowledge. Um, so this is one of the ECHA themes. And what we want to look at is the latest science on climate impacts and how that should inform adaptation and mitigation. We want to look at how humanity can use science to radically transform society. So we know we have these coming decade to make massive changes to the way we do things in order to reduce emissions by over half and also really make our societies more resilient, more inclusive and more equitable. And we want to look at how science can inform action at that local level that has been talked about so much. So what are we doing well? What do we need to do better? And what can we learn from each other? So I hope that with my panelists, we'll be able to delve into these questions. Thank you so very much. So you've got an ample 30 minutes, perhaps a little bit more. Anyway, I think you're going to be given some good signals of the time that you have. I'm going to leave the floor to you. And as before with Frank, I'll pop back at the end for a short chat before I release our audience and your good self into a short coffee break. The floor is yours, Tara. Thank you.
Thank you, Katrina. So just before I welcome all my panelists, I just want to remind you of some more of the key messages that came out of the webinars that particularly speak to our session here today around sharing knowledge. So um, the ECHA community in those webinars wanted to stress that they're committed to science for society and to bring together local and indigenous knowledge with science to inform practical solutions. And we looked at in particular how nature-based solutions can help us to see how we can bring these different forms of knowledge together. Another key message that we felt was really important to highlight in this session is around the need for local hubs around knowledge and research that connect people, problems and solutions in order to accelerate the action we want to see. That these have to bring together not just scientists and policy makers, but also NGOs, citizens and investors, just as we saw in the poll, so that they can become places where we innovate, where we learn by doing, where we share, build trust, collaborate and um, really scale up our actions. So those are just some messages that we want to evolve and build on today during this panel session. So I'd like to um, introduce you to our three panelists. Um, we have two Hanses and one Hervé. Um, you're all very, very welcome. Um, I'm going to start with Hans Otto Portner. Um, Hans Otto is co-chair of Working Group 2 of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The way we're going to run this panel is I'm going to ask each of our panelists the first kind of introductory question. But what we really want to have today is a conversation. And um, when we had a, a run through for this, we, we had so much to talk about that this is going to be a very rich conversation. But Hans Otto, I'm going to start with you for the global perspective. You have access to the latest science on our how human activity is affecting the climate. Are societies and policymakers ready to act at the scale that matches the problem? Are they listening to what you, the scientists, have to say? You're yeah. very welcome, Hans Otto. Yeah, thanks a lot, Tara, and hello, everybody. And, and thanks a lot for, for this overarching question. And a very brief answer uh, would still be to say, uh, no, there is a limitation on, on what we are currently seeing in terms of action. And when we talk about adaptation, clearly um, what, what is coming out of the IPCC assessment reports is that adaptation is essential, but adaptation can only work if we are successful on, on mitigation. So we are we need ambitious mitigation to make adaptation successful as there are adaptation limits that we need to keep um, an eye on. Climate change is happening and causing damages. And in order to make systems resilient, they, they need to transform, they need to transition into different states. And the ecosystems maybe are a very good example for making this uh, very uh, illustrative. We need to strengthen their res resilience under climate change because we want them to help us long term in terms of climate stabilization. But we already are seeing impacts on their capacity to do so. Um, the capacity to build carbon is becoming limited in heat extremes and the most crucial systems are actually um, already suffering from that. So building, building resilience here is important, but we can be successful um, only if we are successful also in the mitigation arena. So quantification of adaptation is another issue. And then that is uh, something that we are struggling with in the science arena uh, as well, because there, has, there are so many challenges involved um, and, and efforts need to address uh, these challenges in, in combination. But usually there is one aspect in focus, for example, adaptation to heat, to sea level rise, to drought, to excess rain, and and uh, but but how do, how are these systems and how are they affected how are they influencing each other is is a core um, issue which doesn't uh, shouldn't stop us to take action moving into action in parallel to continuing research is certainly also one important uh, conclusion based on the science uh, that is that is available so there can be no complete switch to adaptation. Um, because there are adaptation limits, as I said, and for some systems, unfortunately also for some ecosystems, limits are already being uh, surpassed. A complete switch to adaptation is not possible, but adaptation and mitigation together have a lot of synergies and, and that is what we should be going for. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Really great messages there. The limits to adaptation are very important. There's only so much that we can adapt to the scale at which we're changing the climate system. 
is quite staggering. And we cannot expect nature to be there to protect us if at the same time we're destroying it and undermining it as the climate warms and also other human act, um, activities undermine our, our biodiversity and the integrity of our ecosystems. Um, so thank you for getting us started, Hans Otto. Now to hand over to Hans Brunick, who is Executive Director of the European Environment Agency. Um, Hans, you're very welcome. So I wanted to zone in with you a little on the European level, where adaptation is getting more attention, as we heard from Connie Hedegaard and others, um, and our knowledge is developing and the impacts that we're seeing, even now in Europe, are becoming more immediate. But how prepared is Europe for the centuries of warming that lie ahead, in your opinion? Well, uh, thanks for uh, the panel, uh, first of all, and I couldn't agree more with uh, what Hans Otto has said. Uh, and when, when you ask the question how prepared Europe is to face these challenges, well, from, from a policy framing perspective, I think the new climate adaptation strategy uh, of earlier this year is really a major step forward because the, the previous one was an agenda setting policy and strategy, uh, one could say. Uh, of course, a lot of things happened, but it was still early days. Not everybody was convinced of the absolute necessity of strong adaptation measures as well. People didn't really understand all the impacts. And I think we've made a major move forward. And one of the essential components of the strategy is also to build and share better knowledge. And that's what this panel is about. And that, that's where the European Environment Agency, together with all the partners that are in the same boat, can really uh, move things forward by building knowledge that is, for example, more focusing on specific sectors. Yeah? The energy uh, sector will need to adapt. The agricultural sector will need to adapt. We will need to work uh, with the health sector, an underestimated part. So all of these elements matter. Uh, but we need to frame them, as Hans Otto said, in a systemic perspective. So we need to build knowledge at the sector level. We need to integrate that knowledge and then bring it to the different <laughs> levels in Europe where things matter, at the city level, uh, at, at the level of the countryside, uh, very different from Northern Europe to Southern Europe. We need to connect cross-border because there is a lot of attention now for national strategy development and planning, but not necessarily for cross-border effects. So I would say the foundation now is better. The ambitions are higher, uh, aligned with the much higher ambitions now on climate mitigation and for the right reasons. And now we need to make sure that all the experience that is there and that is based on science can be developed in a way that is accessible to those who really need to make the change those who need to finance the change because that is flagged up very often as a key uh, as a key element uh, or, an, or an obstruction to faster adaptation as well and we need to understand the interactions indeed with the natural systems because if we want strong adaptation based on nature we will need strong nature and that that will be a very serious challenge as well so we are in better shape when it comes to policy framing and knowledge development, but uh, a lot still needs to be happen and we need to be very realistic about it. Uh, adaptation is difficult and it's made more difficult uh, if we don't do very strong mitigation. There are two sides of the same coin and, and the coin is called very high uh, ambitions on climate change across the board. Uh, and also a, a, a real sense of urgency. It needs to happen now. We have no time to waste. Thank you, Hans. Yes, we don't have any time to waste, yet I feel this is almost becoming a cliche amongst all of us and how we translate that urgency that, that many of us have been experiencing for a long time into across the sectors, the economic sectors that you spoke to, to the decision makers, to the investors. I think that's where the challenge lies right now. You spoke about making the science accessible to those that are deciding where we spend money, what decisions we take, what policies we adopt. I think that's absolutely um, critical. But I think we can ground truth uh, that a little bit now with Hervé Letrout, who is professor at the Sorbonne University in Ecole Polytechnique, and he's also chair of Climatera in um, Nouvelle-Aquitaine. Hervé, you're very welcome. 
Um, and you work right at the front lines, I guess, of adaptation action in your work through Eclimatera, looking at the translation of science into to, for the purpose of informing and enabling local decision makers and communities to take action on climate. So what type of actions are you seeing on the ground and how is science informing them? Any, any good lessons to share with us, Hervé? Yes, thank you. Uh, at the time I am uh, speaking, there is a big uh, storm over Paris, so it's a bit disturbing, so I'll try to. Uh, uh, I heard uh, just uh, the figures of uh, people interested by, by, by the role of science, and I, I think there is one thing which I didn't hear about uh, the, the role of science, is that we are in a world where we can't more or less anticipate what will happen in the next 20 years because we have emitted greenhouse gases that are there that will not disappear and uh, we we know that uh, th th there are things we, we have to deal with and we, we need to protect ourselves because we also know that things are, are going to change. This idea that we are in a moving uh, circumstance is extremely important I think when you consider the issue of adaptation. Adaptation is not adapting them, uh, 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 getting uh, adapted to a situation that is a, uh, an, an, a stable situation. We are in a moving situation. So what we did in uh, uh, southwest of France, uh, Project Acclimatera, something which was uh, required by, by the, uh, the, the region itself, which uh, was asking for vision of the future. And so it's something that uh, really was uh, uh, encountering some uh, easy success because uh, we, at, at, uh, at the peak of uh, the exercise we did, there were about uh, 4,000 uh, researchers that participated. We did uh, big books that were distributed over the region. And uh, this uh, uh, was uh, uh, apparently very uh, fruitful. but. Uh, we, we, we had this uh, uh, vision of uh, what was happening uh, uh, in, in, in a way that, uh, well, we, we had to consider it in, in, in a way that was not that successful, in the sense that what uh, the, we, we, we managed to see was that uh, the, the decision makers, the people from the region, they were not really caring a lot about uh, what science could say. And, uh, we realized very quickly that this was the result of a difficulty of uh, speaking the same uh, language. We have a language of scientists which, uh, which have its own ethic, which have its own rules. And we have a language of the decision makers, which are people who, who have to take decision in difficult circumstances. So really we, we, we have tried to work on this. How can we make the, the link between what science says, and which is important in, in this moving world, what does it? What what uh, can we make the link between what it says and what the, the, the decision makers want to, to to hear, want to understand? So uh, I think the, the, there is no big solutions for that. First one is to understand the system, of, of the, and we we are working at the local region at the at the big uh, region, which which is a uh, which has a local uh, way of being analyzed. Uh, and this uh, region work as a system. We have to look at the system, the way we can trace uh, the vulnerability of different uh, 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 situations, uh, being mountains, being the agriculture, being the, uh, the shorelines. So we have a lot of uh, situations where we have to, to deal with this. And also, more generally, uh, with the population. So we, we made a, a lot of effort to get to the different parts of the, of the region. The Aquitaine region is a huge region, which is uh, as large as some states. But uh, we, we went into many of those regions. We tried to discuss with the people at all levels, from the, the school uh, the, the students at school to, to the decision makers uh, uh, looking about the, the gestion of the, of the territory. So I think this is something we have to, to be uh, uh, aware about, the, the necessity of this, this uh, 
decision making close to the people. I think uh, if we want really to, to do adaptation, this is different, it has been said uh, in all uh, regions. So we, we really have to look at the details, look at the people, look at what is happening. And uh, this also requires to have some, uh, 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 to, to look at the system with uh, the idea of multidisciplinarity. If we want to do a good science for adaptation, we need to do something which will be also multidisciplinary. Because, well, we, we have the uh, results for the future, which comes from climate models with equations, but you cannot look at biodiversity in the same way, you cannot look at uh, the, the society, the way it will change in the same way. And so we, we have to find the way to, to reconcile all, all those necessities. Uh, in uh, the region, in uh, Bordeaux area, in, in, in the southwest of France area, what we have done is have to, to share a little of the things. We, we have a project, Acclimatera, which is a project of the scientists. And we have a project, Neoterra, which is a project of the, of the region itself. And we have many ways to, to, to make the, the link between ourselves and try to design things in common. And I think we, we need to, to have those approaches to be able to, to do what, of course, we, 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 we need to, to look about uh, uh, um, the diminution of uh, greenhouse gases emission, but we also need uh, to protect our regions and to do them uh, uh, in, in the right manner, looking at uh, what they are in details. Thank you, Hervé. Thank you uh, for those reflections on, on what this means at the, the local level and th these challenges around um, linking the language of scientists with the language of, of decision makers and how do you engage the, you know, the, the, the breadth of, of people, the citizens of, of, a, of a region um, with, with climate action. And I, I really, um, it really resonated with me what you said about the need to make, take decisions and make decisions, design decisions as close as possible to the people. There's two things that you said that I thought would be also um, interesting for Hans Otto to, to reflect on because there are also issues which um, the IPCC is thinking about and which I think all of us who work in the field of climate change and climate science know we need to do better on. So those two things are one, how do we communicate the science better and what have we learned about that and how is that going to be part of um, accelerating the climate action that we need to take in the coming years. And the other thing is around the multidisciplinarity that you spoke about at the end, Hervé. It used to be that climate science was the domain of just that, um, climate scientists, physicists, chemists. We now have a much broader reach of experts and researchers that are part of shaping the reports of the IPCC, for example. So how do we, how do we create those incentives more between disciplines and actually create the platforms that bring them together? Hervé told us a little about how they've been doing it at, in his region. Um, any other reflections on that, Hans Otto, from, from the global perspective and the role of the IPCC? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good uh, question. And certainly the intergovernmental panels that we are currently having, the IPCC and the one for biodiversity and ecosystem services are very good examples how to bring uh, different disciplines together. We are going from climate physics to uh, social sciences and, and are building a, a picture um, in our working group, building a picture of what we call uh, climate resilient development um, and uh, building on a report that we just uh, released on the interactions between climate, biodiversity and society. We, we talk about uh, resilient pathways for ecosystems and society because of because the, they are so highly inter, interdependent in, in terms of uh, people depending on, on what is what nature can provide in, in terms of, of services. And, and we're currently seeing this large scale collapse of services for, um, for, for example, the warm water uh, calls uh, that are losing, that we are losing uh, in terms of their uh, aerial coverage to an extent that they can and will in the future no longer be able to provide uh, fisheries and uh, uh, small scale fisheries and coastal protection to the extent that is, is needed. That's a good example. And I think um, this um, report I'm referring to uh, was the first historically between IPCC and IPBES indicating that even there, we were looking at things in a silo. So one of uh, one aspect, climate change and its challenges and the 
mit Adaptation Mitigation Efforts in IPCC and then on the other side the biodiversity issues and now bringing this together it was in in the outcome was really giving us a positive glimpse in into the future and if we really respect the interaction of those systems and trying to build healthy systems for all um, for all of of these concerned ecosystems and society and, and in a stabilized climate how, how that uh, might work out now there's one overarching message though when we talk about resilient development is that we don't really know the end result i think the most important message is that we have to start the journey it's urgent and going into um, action here is uh, something that is really pressing and is indicated by the rising damages that we are seeing and impacts we are seeing on the side of climate change and also uh, the losses that we are seeing on the side of biodiversity. So early entry into this, we should have started last year, let's do it this year and, and really uh, strengthen our um, ambition. I think then on the way we will be learning. I mean, the industrial revolution also started um, at some point, and certainly people back then didn't know where we would be today. So it'll be something like that as well. The end, but if we don't start, what we know is clearly uh, we will have a lot of uh, problems uh, that will be more and more difficult to overcome the longer we wait. Thank you, Hans Otto. Absolutely. And you reiterated a great point that Hervé made as well, which is that we're not adapting to one different situation. We're adapting to a whole changing situation over time. And that requires reflexibility, but it also requires the bravery to start to do things differently and learn while we go. Now, we don't have much time left in our panel, but I want to go back to Hans and I want to go back to Hervé. Hans, my question to you is, um, as you said, we have a lot of the elements that we need in place. We have a new adaptation strategy within the EU. We have mission adaptation, the EU Green Deal. You could say we've got the policy set at the moment. So. What's missing, in your opinion? Well, I think there are three things missing. One is this real sense of urgency. I mean, we, I think in, in quite a few places, people still think that adaptation is not as urgent. Well, it is urgent. We already see serious damage. Only one third of it is insured, uh, according to our estimates. Um, it is urgent, and that, that's one thing that is missing. A second thing that is missing is uh, investments. Yeah. Adaptation uh, will, in some instances, be expensive, less expensive than not adapting and not mitigating, let's be clear. But we will need to uh, frame what is called an investment pipeline eh, with projects that are fundable, with, with uh, convincing arguments that bring the financial system to climate adaptation. And I think the sustainable finance uh, work in Europe can, can play a major role in that. And then the third thing that is missing, uh, and I think this goes back to what Hans Otto said, eh? we, we, we still need to learn. We are experimenting. We, we have to start doing things. That is a system that allows for a faster and better exchange of knowledge, what is working, what is not working, a better system of indicators that, that allows us to compare what is happening in climate adaptation, not only across countries, but also regions and cities. So it's knowledge, it's political sense of urgency, and it is a, a, a pipeline of, of investable uh, propositions, I would say, projects and the push to drive the financial system in that direction. And if we can push on those three elements, then I think we have a much better chance of having the climate adaptation strategy actually implemented. And we should know that we're in it for the long haul. Yeah? Climate yeah. mitigation, net zero emissions by 2050, that already looks like a really long time horizon. Well, climate adaptation will be with us for much longer than the next three decades. So this will have to be embedded deeply into our policies and our societies for a long time to come. Thank you, Hans. So Hervé, the last word goes to you. 
Um, the scientists working with Hans Otto tell us that limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees is still possible. Um, so that means that adaptation can still be successful, but we need to take radically different actions. What, in your opinion, and from the work you did on the visions with your local communities, what does what did those actions look like? Well, I, I'm not sure exactly about um, the, the, the question, but uh, I, I think that the actions which are uh, needed are, of course, difficult, uh, as was said, to, to, to imagine, uh, because we don't know exactly what will happen in the future. So we, we are... Uh, in, in, in this domain where we, we have to do our best and try to find the right ways to the future, whereas we, we have not all the, 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 the keys, all the clues to, to, to choose this uh, right uh, way to, to advance in the future. Uh, there is one thing I wanted to, to stress, is that, of course, we, we are in a, in a world where we do not have only the... the, 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 the the presence of, uh, of, of problems that we can deal with science. We are also in situations where we have different countries with different cultures, different approaches of the problem, and also uh, a, a number of wars of situations which are which are difficult. It means that we we will be able we will not be able to to govern the situation only through science. We will have to 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 know that there are things that we. Uh, do not master, do not, can't, will never master. And so there is a, a big, uh, I think, importance to be given to the idea of, uh, uh, of um, uh, uh, be, be, being careful about the, the, about the situations. Uh, well, people speak about uh, uncertainties. I prefer to speak about uh, 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 risks. Well, we have risks. Those risks, we have to take them into account. I think they have to be part of what we are trying to, to uh, take into account when we speak about uh, adaptation. Adaptation needs to be also working about uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, uncertainties, the, 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 the kind of uh, issues that we cannot completely invent for the future, but uh, we need to, to have some caution uh, there. And, and this caution is something extremely important. It's really part, it's not that we don't know everything and we, don't, we are not able to, 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 to uh, uh, confront the different problems. We, we need to confront them by being cautious. And, and uh, this caution is something which is very often not considered at the right level uh, when we speak about adaptation, I think. Thank you, Hervé. Thank you, Hans Otto. Thank you, Hans. I won't attempt to sum up, but you've clearly told me that science isn't enough, that we as humanity need a little humility, that we uh, we can't rely on nature if we don't change how we look after nature and the natural systems that we have, and that this is a much broader conversation than one that needs to be uh, led by scientists, culture, empathy, uh, hearts and minds, emotional connections to things like the reality of losing coral reefs. All of these are things we have to we have to grow and bring into the conversation. So thank you to all three panelists and back to Katrina. Thank you so much also from me to the panelists for a fantastic discussion. And there's always so much to say in a limited time. Thank you, Tara. What I really heard again was uh, what we heard from Hervé. There tends to be a language of scientists and a language of decision makers. So we heard from Hans, we need to make the science accessible to the decision makers, not least nourish that science by building knowledge at sectoral level. Give me an idea, because I've heard it before. Decision makers, they have a lot on their plate. Here's the science, urging, urging. How can you make, if you have to say, Kat, I think this is what we mean by just being super clear with the science, give me an example of how we can make sure that happens, because here we are talking about science inspiring action in this panel. I think the hard thing for scientists is that they're very uh, wedded to the limitations of their science, right? So they're very honest about the fact that there's limitations to it. And policymakers often want science to deliver absolutes, and that's not possible. But what scientists need to do is also to figure out how to speak that language of this policymaker, to give them short, succinct information about the key actions they need to take, uh, and allow them to come back then for the caveats and the explanations. Because just as our panelists said, we just need to start. We need to learn as we do. And we will do that in an imperfect understanding 
of what the impacts are that are awaiting for us and the outcomes of our actions. So it is about bravery on all sides. But yeah, as scientists, be brave. Give, your, give the policymakers your actions on one page uh, and then be there to support them as they roll those out. Thank you. And I really appreciate the fact that you absolutely answered that question most concisely and most comprehensively. So scientists, be brave. We heard there from Sandrine earlier. Politicians, be brave. Thank you for me. And just something else that really came out is if we want adaptations based on nature, then we need strong nature. So thank you to all of you. Now I'm going to be able to release you and I'm going to be able to release our audience for a just under 15 minute break actually. So 12 minutes. Grab a coffee, grab something stiffer if that's your uh, little uh, predilection at this time of the day. Tweet hashtag ECA 2021. I'm urging you to make that trend. Take a walk around the block. Do not be back later than 11.15 because we've got a second session and that second session features two more dynamic panels ahead of a 75 five minute lunch break. So come on, you don't need longer than 12 minutes. Be back here very, very soon. Thank you to all my lovely speakers thus far.